The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Twenty-three is the magic number as we hit go on Tuesday here. On July the 7th, 2020, 23 days until the NBA comes back, but a couple players down once again. Welcome to Fantasy NBA Today, everybody. I am Dan Vespers. This is a hoop ball presentation. That website, of course, is hoop-ball.com. The Twitter handle is at hoopballfantasy. My Twitter handle is at Dan Vespers. Pretty easy to find. D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S. As you've heard me say a number of times, if you want to get involved with us here at HoopBall on the writing or podcasting side, we're looking for folks that uh, are good at DFS, sports betting, or sales. It's not a podcast. That's just phone calls. But hit me up. Uh, I want to throw that out there at the beginning of the show today. Also of note, not a basketball thing, but apparently baseball is supposed to come back in 16 days, which seems completely harebrained and crazy. But I guess they were assuming that their guys were staying loose during the COVID shutdown, and we'll see how all of that shakes out. I know they're going through their weird rounds of testing, and those are imperfect. And frankly, just hearing from baseball players, no one sounds all that excited about getting this year going. For the NBA, it's a little bit more of a mixed bag. You know the teams at the top are going to be more excited than the teams at the middle or the bottom And we're seeing that now with players opting out. And that's where we're going to start on today's podcast. Don't worry. A little bit later on, we'll continue our build of our NBA resumption draft board, which, by the way, uh, I will put out at the end of all of this. When we're done with everything, I'll put out this draft board. If you guys, you'll just have to uh, give out an email address. I'll send it out that way. I don't want it just floating around on Twitter. Uh, But we'll do that probably maybe end of this week, something like that. Start to get some mocks going. Reminder quickly, everybody, if you're looking for these Roto Leagues, they are available over at Fantrax.com. Our buddy Adam King is working on setting those things up, so if you need to find them, that's the place to go. This morning, we got word that two NBA players, one of them a superstar, the other one a relatively well-known player, are opting out, and one player late last night opted in. Though I think at least from a fantasy standpoint and a reality standpoint the player opting in probably was well no that's not fair let's just jump right into it so uh starting with the players that opted out Bradley Beal opted out this morning which is something that is not overly surprising just given the situation in Washington I I just for for weeks now on this podcast I have wondered aloud why anyone On the Spurs, that's a veteran of any kind is going. And anyone on the Wizards, that's a veteran, is going. The only reason I didn't wonder this same thing aloud about the Phoenix Suns is that they're so young that it seems like any game they can play together is probably a good one for them. Just opportunities to play competitive basketball. But for the Spurs, that's a team with... Uh, a, a different goal set. No LaMarcus Aldridge. They're not going to get into that play-in game. It's just not happening. So why is DeMar DeRozan still going? I don't know. And for the Wizards, Bradley Beal opting out changes things quite a lot, both from a reality and a fantasy standpoint. We'll start on the reality side. Uh, you know, this is a Washington team that, with Brooklyn now missing their entire team, and we'll talk about that in a moment, the... The Wizards actually had a weird fleeting outside chance to get into that play-in game. I know they aren't particularly close, and you have to be within three games to force the best-of-three play-in stuff. Uh, But at five and a half games back of the Magic and six back of the Nets, you could see Brooklyn losing six or seven of these resumption eight games. What if the Wizards happen to go like five and three in a crazy twist? I I mean, I I never thought that they would, but... More insane things have happened that would have gotten them to within striking distance. Well, that feels like it's not going to happen now. I don't think there's even a a hope. And, again, from a reality standpoint, a couple weeks back we talked about how Davis Bertans opting out 
might have made it difficult for the Wizards to re-sign him if the locker room felt like he was abandoning the team. But now, the team leaders, I say z with an S on the end because John Wall's not going, uh, and now you throw Bradley Beal into the mix, those two guys not going have basically said, look, it's fair game. If you don't want to go, don't go. We're not making the playoffs, and even if we did, we'd get smoked by Milwaukee in four games. So let's stay healthy. Let's give the world, let's give scientists and, and well, I, I mean, it really is the world. Let's give scientists four months until our next training camp to figure out treatments, maybe even a vaccine, even if it's not the perfect one. And then we'll get back out there for a regular season, healthy, and put ourselves in a position to maybe win some basketball games. There's just, there was no real impetus here. So Bradley Beal opting out changes a couple of things for us as well. We haven't gotten to any other Wizards in our our draft board, but we did have Bradley Beal at 10 if he was coming. Well, he ain't. So everybody else gets moved up a slot, and it's going to take forever to change the numbers on all of these players. It's why I should have done this in Excel. But I didn't. I was just typing a list, and now I'm paying the ultimate price. So our 10th ranked player is gone. Everybody slides up one spot, and it changes the complexion of what we're going to do with Washington later on because no wall, which we knew, New no Bertans, which we had already known, and now no Bradley Beal, leaves the Wizards a bit shorthanded. And somehow they're not even going to be the most shorthanded team we talk about today. Thomas Bryant, at number 108 during the regular season, is now the highest ranked fantasy player on the Washington Wizards going to Orlando. Rui Hachimura was at 136. Troy Brown was at 146. Shabazz Napier was at 151 for the season, although that was obviously different in his time with Washington, particularly the very end of the regular season, or the, the, the real, the original flavor regular season. So don't worry. These guys will work our way onto their lists, but I think it's worth mentioning that as we go through some of these names, we have to be very careful and we have to figure out, especially as we get deeper into our draft board, where we're going to be skipping over guys. There's going to be a lot of guys that get skipped over, not necessarily because they're not coming, but because they just don't deserve to be on our board, and because other guys that are deeper on the list are seeing a bigger jump for the resumption period, Shabazz Napier being a very clear example of that. Napier was inside the top 100 over his last 11 games, which is a weird cross-section for him because he played a handful of games with one team, another team, a third team. He was bounced all around at the All-Star break. And then right at the very end, Washington threw him into the starting lineup, and he looked pretty good, even alongside Bradley Beal. No Beal. A lot of Shabazz coming up. A lot of Shabazz coming up. Legitimate chance at a top 50 resumption game. Maybe higher, even. So let's make sure we put him. That's the first thing we're going to do today. We're going to put Shabazz Napier on our wait list because he's just the type of guy who was so far down the ranking board at 151 that he could have gotten lost in the shuffle a little bit. So we're going to put him, you can hear me typing it right now as we speak, because everything we're doing is piece by piece on this podcast. We're putting him on our wait list because I don't know if these other guys, if if we were going to get that far. I mean, I assume we're going to, but you never know. Uh... Thomas Bryant, Rui Hachimura, Troy Brown, all of these guys are in the mix now. Because when Beal departs, his 23 shots per game are getting distributed among the rest of this team. Davis Bertans was taking 11, 34 shots. That's almost half when this team was was rolling. I mean, those two guys accounted for like 30 to 40% of the team's Offensive opportunities. There's a ton to be picked up by these other guys. And so you just look for who has fantasy game. Who, if you injected a jolt of usage into their game, would change things. And you've got Napier, Troy Brown, Hachimura, Thomas Bryant. All of these guys are now in the mix. And we will get to them as we build our draft board. The other news, and I mean, it's like, 
deal with, they're coming fast and furious now. Spencer Dinwiddie opted out. We kind of knew this one was coming. He was considered questionable. He had the questionable tag. But I think, to quote our good buddy Brandon Marcus, when guys get upgraded from out to doubtful, that means they're probably going to play. When they get downgraded, that means they're probably not. This was a downgrade. Dinwiddie going from likely to questionable last week when his COVID test came back positive. He thought he was making some improvements. In fact, Dinwiddie was, and this was kind of... uh kind of illuminating and kind of cool in this time where I think a lot of us would feel comforted by hearing about people's experiences. And Dinwiddie was tweeting, hey, you know, this is day 11 that I've had symptoms. The sinus pressure is starting to subside. Uh, That I think was yesterday or the day before. And ultimately, he just didn't feel healthy enough. And I guess the thought here is, number one, you know, we've heard from many people, thousands of people in the population, that the effects of this disease can linger for a long, long time. You don't get back to 100% for a while, if ever. So he's thinking about his career. And if he's not 100% and he's now going to go down and try to ramp up his training camp, play in eight games, maybe, if he's healthy enough to even do it, if he gets there in time to even be ready for those eight games, and then what, four, maybe five games of playoffs? It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's worth it if he's healthy. And I honestly believe that Dinwiddie and DeAndre Jordan probably would have traveled if they were healthy. I know there's all this other stuff going on. But I think those guys actually wanted to play at least a little bit. In fact, DeAndre Jordan was finally getting his starting job. Talked about how I was actually really excited to draft him because I thought he was going to get underdrafted. Dinwiddie's not a guy I was particularly excited to draft because I think his fantasy game is overblown as a points assists guy who, as we talked about before, drops a boulder in the ocean on a couple of his stuff and just weighs your team down that way and percent it, the namely field goal percent, but uh, not great free throw either. He's not going. And now the Nets are down. Bear with me on this one. Spencer Dinwiddie, DeAndre Jordan, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, Wilson Chandler, and Nick Claxton. Again, for the folks in the back, Irving, Jordan, Dinwiddie, Durant, Chandler, Claxton. All out. All out for Brooklyn. Now it almost becomes easier to say who's left. Jared Allen is left. Karis LeVert is left. Joe Harris, Garrett Temple, Torian Prince, they're left. This changes things. It really does. We'd already talked about how Karis LeVert was going to have a a ton of usage, and that number goes up even farther because, listen, I know Kevin Durant didn't play this year, so it's not like you can say him being out changes the way the team is going to operate, but Spencer Dinwiddie was taking 16 shots a game this year. DeAndre, 5, which, again, not a high-usage guy. Kyrie, 21. We saw how this team operated when Kyrie Irving was out during the regular season. It was a lot of Dinwiddie because, generally, Levert was out. When he came back, he took the reins in the first unit. The obvious conclusions here is that Jarrett Allen and Karis Levert see the largest bumps due to the various absences on the Brooklyn Nets. But I'm also not sure that someone like Joe Harris can't get over the cut line now. He was 140 this year, which is not good enough during a standard nine-category fantasy season. But we've now, again, pulled eight teams out of the mix, and so 20%—or, excuse me, 27% of 140 is 38. So the very same fantasy season for Joe Harris puts him right on the cusp of being a top 100 guy. Throw in an extra, I don't know, one shot? I mean, do we think he gets one of Spencer Dinwiddie's shots? One shot that Dinwiddie or Wilson Chandler might have taken during a game towards the end of the regular season? And we, and again, Kyrie Irving being out for most of the year, we sort of already know what a lot of these guys look like with him out. Dinwiddie's absence... Chandler's absence on top of it is not something we had at the end of the year. It's not a point of comparison. So I think Joe Harris now probably makes it to the end of the potential draft list. 
He's not going to be exciting, but he's a good percentages guy for someone who knocks down a bunch of three-pointers. You know, last three years, he shot 49, 50, and 47%, 42, 47, and 41 from downtown. He took 11 shots a game this year as a career high, averaged 14 points a game. Field goal percent was down season over season. The rest of his stuff was pretty much the same. Played 30 minutes last year, 31 this year. I don't know that 31 changes much, but if the 11 shots becomes 12, he likely moves inside the top 100 more permanently. You're also possibly looking at him taking seven three-pointers a game and making about three of those. Three three three-pointers a game. I know threes are easy to come by these days, but three at a time is a pretty juicy number. And then honestly, with Levert, you know, he was 182 during the regular season. We need to put him on our wait list as we're building this board because he's another guy that we're going to want to slot in uh, probably already. Truth be told, he probably belongs on the draft board already. Remember, we left off at number 51 yesterday. Would I rather have Karis Levert or Brooke Lopez during this resumption season? It's Levert, and it's actually not even that close. What about looking up a few slots? Would you rather have Levert or Norman Powell? I think I'd rather have Levert. Just for the chance he goes completely bananas. So he's already a name that wasn't close during the regular season. Played really well for about two weeks at the very end of the year. And now is probably going to play 30 minutes a game and have usage beyond his wildest dreams. Would I put him up above guys like Rudy Gobert and Miles Turner? But he healed. That's pretty close to the threshold for me. But I would very happily slot him in at 44 on our current list. We're going to have to remake some of these things, man. We got numbers jumping all around. So those are your notes in terms of news. And it was big stuff. It changed the way fantasy goes. By the way, I uh, want to stop myself and let everybody know. Remember, on on the last couple of shows, as we've been building this draft board, I've said that at the end, we're going to go back and we're going to tweak it. Well, what does that mean? It means at the end, we're going to go back and we're going to quickly, flipbook style, maybe over the span of two shows, go back through what we talked about before this build. You guys remember what we did before this? We went through all 22 teams and talked about how we were making adjustments up or down for the various players on their rosters. But what we don't want to miss is the guys who were ranked low before who have a chance to go much higher now. I mean, you could even throw Torian Prince into that mix. The other way we could do this, and there's there's two ways we could go about it. It will I'll make a judgment call on which I think is more interesting for a podcast. Uh the 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 battle, the mental struggle I'm working on right now is. Is it more interesting to go back through the team's flipbook style and just say, okay, here's Brooklyn. Was there anybody outside the top 150 that deserves a big jump? Yes, Karis LeVert, uh, probably Torian Prince. That's it. What about Washington? Same thing. We found a couple of names there. What about the Lakers? Uh, JaVale McGee, Dwight Howard, guys like that. We'll want to go through those teams and uh, assign those players spots. Or the other choice is we just go really damn deep into the original player list and make sure we don't miss anybody that way. You know, Basketball Monster goes through the top 188 on their main page, so that should get us probably about as many names as we need. Right? Like, is uh, is Dwight on that list? No, Dwight Howard wasn't inside the top 188, so maybe maybe it doesn't get us everybody we need, but it, we, JaVale McGee was, so, you know, it'll cover most of our bases. I want to remind everybody once again to check out our buddies over at Manscaped.com. I know a handful of you have already used the coupon code, and for that, I am eternally grateful. Let me be more clear about this. If we can develop a successful partnership with Manscaped.com, we can add things to HoopBall that change what you guys get. Beyond the podcast, things like tools, metrics, things that we've been wanting to add, but these things take time. Uh, stat feeds, so you don't have to be bouncing back and forth between ESPN box scores and hoop ball. All of these things, unfortunately, they are costly, 
And this is a way to do it. So, uh, you know, again, I don't ask for very much on this podcast. I really don't. A review, a rating or review every once in a blue moon. This is one of those times. So please go to manscaped.com. Use coupon code HOOPBALL20. I will repeat, HOOPBALL20, all one word, at manscaped.com. You can check out their products. The Lawnmower 3.0 is brand new. It's got that sweet built-in LED light. They have uh, deodorants, body washes, refreshing sprays. They have foot deodorant if you want to go that route. They have cologne. They have uh, towels, boxers, T-shirts, travel bags, shaving mats, breath mints. You don't have to get a giant shaving blade to use the coupon code. They have stuff there that's extremely affordable. I mean, the boxers are only 15 bucks. Wait, are they boxer briefs? They might be boxer briefs. They got boxer briefs that are 15 bucks. Use a coupon code and you get them for $12. Just please go check it out. Get something over at manscaped.com. Uh, the lawnmower 3.0 is, uh, I believe, something like about 50 bucks after using the coupon code. It's pretty sweet. The built in LED is awesome. Really, it changes things because you don't need blinding sunlight to see all the hairs in your face. Come on, listen. Haven't you guys shaved your neck and then gone to work and realized that there was one Sproinger you didn't get? Probably because the light in your bathroom is coming from sort of above you and to the left, and then there was the one hair on the right that didn't get illuminated. The LED. It's a great idea. I don't know why this, I don't know why this wasn't a thing before. So again, manscaped.com. Coupon code is HoopBall20. I need you. I, personally, Dan, Bespris, I need you, you guys to help me with this. Plus, if they like what we do, then other places might come aboard. We get all sorts of new stuff. Positive feedback loop, everybody. Positive feedback loop. By the way, the opt-in that we haven't talked about yet was the aforementioned Dwight Howard, who decided that he wanted to be a part of the Lakers' run towards a championship, which, dang, it's weird. Considering how much hate I've had for Dwight Howard over the years as one of the real pricks of the NBA, he really does seem like he's turned a corner this year. That's really a, I mean, that is surprising as hell because one thing that I thought that I had learned in life is that people don't really change after the age of about 25. Like, you kind of are who you are at a certain point. And at the ripe age of 33, because it seemingly happened before he signed with the Lakers last year, Dwight Howard had this sort of awakening where he's become... A, a likable, good teammate who's now fighting for social justice, and he's going to come with the Lakers, but he wants to make sure that he continues his fight. He's donating his seven hundred grand that he's likely to make by coming with the team to nonprofits to further social justice. I, I am, I'm floored. I'm floored. Every fiber of my being wanted to be annoyed and dislike Dwight Howard because of what he had done as a as a human slash basketball player for the better part of a decade, just kind of like going from team to team and ruining locker rooms and not utilizing his talent set the right way, you know, not listening when someone wanted to run and pick and roll with him because they could just throw it 80 feet in the air. He could go up and hammer it through. He could have been one of the best role men that ever lived and then all of a sudden now, it's like the light bulb went on. Fighting for justice. Good teammate. And now, he's going to opt in. He's going to go with the Lakers, try to win that championship, and try to use the platform, and donating his salary. Good for you, Dwight Howard. Hell of a job, man. I am on... Listen, I'm willing to, to change the way I think about things. When new data comes to light. And new data has come to light. Dwight Howard, I am in your camp now. Firmly. After being one of the biggest Dwight Howard haters to, to walk this earth for about eight years now. I'm in your camp. Well done, Dwight Howard. Well done. Everything about this, everything about what he's done this year has screamed good person who figured it out. The important things in this world. 
That's helpful for the Lakers. As a Laker fan, that also makes me happy. As a fantasy enthusiast, this also makes me um, stop and think. This is a thinker. Because if Dwight Howard had opted out, and the Lakers, we know, are not that far away from clinching the one seed in the Western Conference. They're five and a half games up on the Clippers, only eight games in this resumption season. So uh, they win three of them, and it's done. At which point, you've got to believe that Anthony Davis is going to be playing partial basketball games, probably similar to what he did in New Orleans after demanding a trade. Played in half games for a while, sat a couple games, and then ultimately they finally just sat him for good. With eight games, you don't have enough time to go through that entire progression, but he could play the first three games at mostly full bore, maybe like 29, 30 minutes instead of 33 or 34 dial him back to 24, maybe 20, maybe you rest him in game seven and play him a couple minutes in game eight. If Dwight Howard had opted out, JaVale McGee was going to be a beast for fantasy. With Dwight playing, McGee is still good enough. And that's the point I really want to stress here. It does limit his effectiveness, but it doesn't eliminate his effectiveness. As you may recall, earlier this year, Anthony Davis missed a handful of games with a bruised tailbone in, I believe, mid-January. Am I getting that timeline right? Dwight Howard was playing at that point. Dwight Howard was part of the mix during those games, and both he and JaVale McGee each had big ball games. JaVale got the start played about 22 minutes a game. Dwight came off the bench, played a couple minutes more than that, and then they were brief stretches where they went relatively small. But the overarching point is that both of those guys had fantasy value when Anthony Davis was out. Interestingly, Dwight Howard had more fantasy value than McGee coming off the bench during those games. The key, of course, with Dwight is, please, Lord, don't send him to the free throw line because he still can't make them. It's just never going to be a thing he does. But during those games, Dwight had a 12 and 14, a 21 and 15, a 9 and 16. He went for 6 and 10 with three blocks. Which is why there's a case to be made to stuff those two guys at the end of your bench. And it's why we're going to go exceedingly deep in our ranking list. Right, JaVale McGee was 141 during the regular season. He would, he'll be someone that will eventually cover as we're building our board. Dwight Howard wasn't even remotely close to fantasy value because of, well, his free throw shooting was a big part of it. He was number 238. If you wipe out free throw shooting, he jumps up to a fairly respectable mark. Can your team handle the free throw misses? I don't know. Thus, even though Dwight might have the better two- or three-game stretch when Anthony Davis is out, McGee is the guy that your team can weather the storm on. There's less swing there. So put Dwight Howard in the back of your mind as, like, maybe it gets to your 15th-round pick and there's just no one left out there. You could scoop him up. But also be aware that he could fill in for AD and go 6 of 12 at the free-throw line and cost you three roto points in one game. You know, eight games, someone misses three free throws. That's a really big deal. So don't go nuts. Well, we've spent more than half the show talking about the news of the day because, well, frankly, it was big news and it changed the fantasy prospects of a number of players. So let's get through a couple more names on our draft board. We have a lot left to go. (sighs) Left off at Ricky Rubio when we stopped yesterday, and so that's where we'll pick things up here, provided my internet will actually do the things I want it to do. And it's back up and running, and so, well, we can pick up where we left off. Uh, Lonzo Ball was actually the last name we covered. Excuse me. Uh, Remember, we slotted him a bit earlier. He was number 70, and that puts us at number 71, which is DeJounte Murray. I'm a huge DeJounte Murray fan, especially... For this restart, I wasn't a massive one going into this most recent season because it wasn't clear how his health and uh, the Derek White situation was going to play out. And it was a royal pain in the butt for a large portion of the season. 
But when push came to shove, DeJounte did hit his marks. He finished at number 71, uh, generally a, a little bit above or right around where he was drafted in only 25 minutes a game and seemingly ramped up as the season progressed. Also a big deal on that front. 11.6 boards, 4 assists, 1.7 steals, pretty good percentages from Murray, and I see no reason why his numbers would go down given that LaMarcus Aldridge is out, and I'm guessing that DeMar DeRozan is going to be sitting by part way through this thing, and maybe they'll go a little bit easy on Murray, but, I mean, why? He was just finally getting his sea legs back before. Last game before the shutdown, he had 17 points, 7 rebounds, 6 assists, 6 steals, and a block. Yeesh. That's a line and a half. I love him. I love DeJounte Murray. I think he should play 7 of the 8 games here, and he's better than some of the guys we already have on our list again. I mean, I could make the argument that he should be even farther up the board, if not for the fact that I'm a little bit worried they do rest him more than one game. But I would certainly rather have Murray than the bottom five or six guys on our chart right now. I think I could make the argument that he goes right around Jaron Jackson Jr. area and ahead of Evan Fournier, Will Barton, Jalen Brown, Rashawn Holmes, Brooke Lopez, Ricky Rubio. Right? I mean, there's no reason he should be behind that. I might even end up moving Marcus Smart at some point along this whole mess. But we're going to put DeJounte Murray in there, and we'll tweak it later on. This is, Again, this is where it gets hard to slot people in because everybody's so jammed together. OG Ananobi was number 72 during the regular season, but the Raptors are fully healthy, and as bullish as I am on Ananobi for next year, he is not as good when the whole team was there this season. And so I'm going to put him at the end of our list. He's going to be the first guy we've actually put behind Ricky Rubio to date. He also has the issue with Toronto of maybe not needing to play all eight of these basketball games. Nerlens Noel was number 73, Presumably, Steven Adams comes into this thing healthy, and for Noel, a lot of his value this year was tied up in the fact that Adams was playing uh, either missing a couple of games for the first time seemingly ever, or playing partial games that allowed Noel's value to surge. I expect him to be closer to the end of the pack. I'm not going to put him on the waiting list because I think we can just probably slot him in there where he's at right now. Uh, and then we'll probably put guys in front of him as we work our way through the board. Um, checking our wait list out real quick here, I think we are now starting to get close to a couple of these names. Namely, uh, Al Horford is not that far off. Hassan Whiteside is not that far off. If Jonathan Isaac plays, he would be well above some of these guys, but he's not all that far off as well. Shabazz Napier is not all that far off. So let's, let's keep our eye on these things. The wait list and the real list are starting to come together a little bit at this juncture. Terry Rozier, not playing. That was easy. Wipe him off the board. Mikhail Bridges in Phoenix. I think he should have a really nice resumption, actually. He was playing his butt off right at the end of the regular season. Uh, we've heard already, now they're saying they want to get Kelly Oubre cleared to play at some point during the resumption, but I'm going to guess that he, even if he does, it's not going to be very much. Devin Booker's probably not going to play a full allotment of minutes. Ricky Rubio is probably not going to play a full allotment of minutes. Like I've said before, I think DeAndre Ayton's the only guy on that team where they might feel like they want him to actually play most of the ball game. Besides, perhaps, Mikael Bridges, who should definitely get drafted. Even, uh, you know, he needs the playing time. They want him to work on his offense. And so, uh, let's throw him in there ahead of Ananobi and ahead of Nerland's Noel, but I'll lump him in near the Lopez-Ricky Rubio bunch, and we might move him around as things move along as well. So I like Mikhail Bridges. I think this should be interesting for him. Devontae Graham, next name on the list. Not going! Daniel Tice at 78. You guys know I love me some Daniel Tice. I do. I do. Uh, I think from an actual value standpoint, he also will be above a number of these names on our board from a where do I think other people are going to draft him standpoint. I think he'll probably go later than that. But what I will say for now is uh, just in terms of who will play, Tice is going to play. And if you're going to play, you get a bump. So someone like a Brooke Lopez who's not going to play, I push him down the board and I'm going to put Tice ahead of him. So he's jumping up the board a little bit, uh, slotting in front of Lopez, Rubio, Bridges, Ananobi, and, and Nerland's Noel. 
I like Daniel Tice maybe more than I should. Eric Bledsoe was number 79 during the regular season. I don't know how many games he's going to play during this resumption, but I do think he's above some of these guys, if only because also these guys might not play all of their games. And when Bledsoe is healthy, he's, he's better than these other dudes. So we weigh the positives and the negatives. How many games is he going to play? Four? And a couple of halfers? That's a tough pill to swallow. I'm going to put him ahead of Ananobi and ahead of Nerland's Noel, but it's not by much. Even though he is better, fantasy-wise, when healthy than those dudes, you just can't trust him to play in the games. Remember, we're looking for guys that are going to actually survive the eight games. Brandon Clark was number 80, and he's healthy. Although it sounds like the Grizz might have Justice Winslow back. Or did he say, did he opt out? I might be forgetting that one. Regardless, Brandon Clark, he's probably going to resume basically the role he had before. Uh, which, as we've seen from these numbers, puts him very close to Bledsoe and Anobi and Nerlens Noel. But the difference here is Brandon Clark is going to play eight games. He's going to play eight games. I don't think we can say that about anybody uh, in our bottom six right now. Daniel Tice is probably the last guy where you're thinking, yeah, he should probably play in all eight. Brooke Lopez, no. Rubio, no. Bridges, maybe. Bledsoe, no. And Anobi, no. Nerlens Noel, yeah, I guess, but he's going to drop off a little bit. And so, for that reason, while his numbers, Clark's numbers are not going to jump off the page, he's a percentages guy, plodding type right now, and from a fantasy standpoint, in the early part of his career, he'll have his opportunity at some point. Uh, I think I would rather have Brandon Clark than Brooke Lopez. I think I'd rather have him over Ricky Rubio if he's not going to play most of these games. And we're going to have to move some of these names around, make no mistake, because I'm also looking at him and thinking, geez, maybe I'd rather have Mikhail Bridges, who I think is probably going to play close to eight. And at the same time, I don't know. So we're flipping him in there next to Daniel Tice. Brandon Clark going behind him ahead of Brooke Lopez because I don't think Brooke plays more than four and a half games. I mean, it's just such a big deal. If you're actually playing all eight games, you lap the guys, even if they're one, two rounds in front of you in regular value. Remember, Brooke Lopez was 61. Brandon Clark is 80. But an extra two to three games, he would crush him. Let's do a little bit more. A little bit more. Uh, Serge Ibaka was 81. He was not good when the Raptors were healthy this year. Um, to me, it puts him in a similar boat to Nerland's Noel, who probably also won't be seeing a ton of playing time. I'm going to put Ibaka just at the end since, you know, they both had their chances with the guys in front of them hurt. Nerland's was better with his than Serge was on his, and so Ibaka's going to go uh, at the end of our chart. And by the way, we are now definitely getting into the names that will be going behind guys on our wait list. So let's do a couple more from the real list, and then let's slot in our wait list, guys. Larry Nance Jr. was 82. He's not going. Jabari Parker was 83, but that was mostly before his trade to Sacramento, so you can just slot him off to the side, plus he had COVID or has COVID, Malcolm Brogdon at 84 is, uh, we still don't know if he's going. But with no Oladipo, if he says he is going, we're looking more at the Malcolm Brogdon from earlier in the season when he was more like a top 50, top 40 guy as opposed to the top 110 towards the end of the season when it just wasn't right. So Brogdon is the last name I want to do right now because he's an interesting one. He's going to go farther up the chart. This is, of course, if he goes... He probably plays in at least six, probably seven, maybe eight. So I'm not doing any demotion or promotion based on how many games I expect him to play. But we do know that if he's right, and for Indiana, no Oladipo, no Jeremy Lamb, they're going to need everything they can get. He should be going way above some of these names on our list. Back up in that Gobert, Turner, Buddy Heald, Levert, Norman Powell grouping, where there does seem to be a tiny drop-off there. I'll put him ahead of Norman Powell and behind Karis Levert. So that's now Malcolm Brogdon's slot. And, of course, if he's not there, you just yank him out. Easy enough. No problem. But he's a guy that gets a potentially very large boost in this resumption game. And I want to pause now looking at the original list because we're only up to, like, 56, 57 guys on our list, which does 
honestly correspond relatively well. We were at what? We were at 84. The hell's 27% of 84? 23? All right, so we should have been around around 60 or so. And listen, when we slot in our waitlist guys, we probably do get relatively close to 60 here. Plus, I haven't readjusted all of my numbers since pulling Bradley Beal out. So uh, all of these guys slide up one spot, and then I threw a few names in there. The numbers are all discombobulated. I think we're at about 56 or 57 names on our list right now. And looking at our wait list, I can tell you definitively, I'd rather have a Son Whiteside than a couple of these guys. Even if he's coming off the bench, he can do a lot of damage in 24, 25 minutes. Uh, I think I'd rather have Al Horford than some of these guys towards the end of the list. I would definitely rather have Shabazz Napier than some of these guys at the end of the list. And then DeMar DeRozan, I'm still not touching. I, I really, I don't think he plays more than two games during this resumption. So he's he's very much on the outside looking in. So let's start with Hassan Whiteside, who was number eight. And he's almost definitely going to get drafted before he gets to this point. But we're at a juncture now where someone like a Nerlens Noel, who 19 minutes off the bench, similar stat ability to Hassan Whiteside, who will do it more on the rebounding and blocks, and Noel will do it more in the steals and not missing free throws departments. But both of those guys can do damage in short minutes. I like Whiteside more because I don't trust Yusuf Nurkic to actually be healthy enough to go. So I'm going to put Whiteside in front of Noel, uh, and I would even consider throwing in front of Ananobi and Bledsoe just because I think he'll play most of Portland's games. He did this year. And then uh, Ananobi... Uh, maybe we'll keep him in front. I might drop Bledsoe down a few slots when we do some tweaks later. But for now, we're going to throw Whiteside in. He deserves to be back on the list. Al Horford, I would put also uh, in front of Ibaka. But I think behind Nerland's Noel. Because with Horford, if he only gets 24 minutes a game, that's actually not enough for him to do damage. For Noel, if he gets his 19-20, that actually is. So Horford's back on the list now. Uh, I mentioned Shabazz Napier as the other waitlist guy I want to get back on the list. He's about to clobber. Th this list is hard to make f when you get to a guy like Napier because he was in the 150s during the regular season. He was ramping up. He was going to be a quiet kind of sleeper type because he was playing well even alongside Bradley Beal. But now that Beal has opted out, Everyone is going to be looking at Shabazz Napier, and we have to figure out how early we need to go get him. I don't know if he's going to play all eight games. He's actually a veteran, even though no one has ever really talked about him as such. You know, Napier's been in the NBA for a while. He's just never had a real job in the NBA. This is his seventh, uh, sixth season? Sixth season in the NBA. So he's not a spring chicken. He's not old by any stretch. But it's not like he's come in, you know, one last year or this year and needs the playing time. He's 29 in a week. You know, he's he's in his prime. So, you know, I don't know what the Wizards want to do here. Do they want to try to keep him right? Do they want to just turn him loose and say have some fun? I'm inclined to think that that's the direction they lean because if he's going to go down there and he's going to go through all the training camp stuff and the bubble and the isolation, it might just to hold him out at that point would almost be offensive to a guy that's never had a giant role and could for eight games just have some fun. So what was Napier doing on a Wizards team that just goes buck wild with offense? when he didn't have any shackles on him. And it, uh, I mean, it was impressive. It was impressive. The last two games before the league turned off, Napier had 27 points, four boards, seven assists, and four steals, and four three-pointers, and followed that up with 21, two, and six, three steals, and three three-pointers, making 17 out of 20 free throws in those two games. Those two games were first-round value. Is he going to be a first-rounder for eight games? Nah. Nah. But good assists, good steals, to go along with the fact that apparently now he takes three-pointers. Go figure. Hasn't always been a part of his game, but such is the way the NBA is trending. He's an excellent foul shooter, career 82%, and uh, more like 83-84 over his last three seasons. Horrible field goal percent. That's where he's going to drill you. 
If you want to look for a comp to someone during the regular season, I would say look at Devontae Graham with better steals numbers. That's what Shabazz Napier is potentially looking at here. Maybe even with a tiny bit of extra usage. 18 points, 7.5 assists, 3 three-pointers, and instead of one steal, make it 1.4. And you've got basically what Devontae Graham is, but a little bit better defensively. Devontae Graham was 77 during the regular season. If you pull out the 21-ish players in front of him, that puts him, if he, if he were to be playing, at about 55 during the resumption season. But look, look at the players in the top 55 right now that we've gone through. He to be better. He would be better than that. As will Napier. And on the notion that I think he's going to play in all eight of these games, I think you could look at Shabazz Napier in that grouping right after the obvious upper crust, basically where we just slotted in Malcolm Brogdon. So we cleared the really familiar names. The Gobert, Brandon Ingram, Gallo, Miles Turner, Buddy Heald. And now we're throwing in Levert, Brogdon, Jaron Jackson Jr., DeJounte Murray. But it's well ahead of the Rubios, the Brandon Clarks, the Brooke Lopez's, even the Daniel Tices, even, frankly, the Jalen Browns of the world. Those guys are capped out. Napier, there's almost no cap here. So I'm throwing him in there right near Brogdon. I would take Shabazz Napier at about 46. Right in that same range with Murray and Powell and Brogdon and JJJ. And I got to move Marcus Smart down my board a little bit is what I keep noticing as I'm looking at this. Marcus Smart, you've got to move down. I don't know how far, but I need you down farther. I need you uh, more in that Barton-Fournier grouping. So I'm going to say... Oh, boy. Norman Powell or Shabazz Napier? Norman Powell or Shabazz Napier? We'll go Shabazz first here. So right around 45 is what we're looking at. I don't think it's that's crazy. I mean, he could he could miss that mark, but I don't think it'd be by much. And now, I think we've got our waitlist guys back on the, the board. Jonathan Isaac, still don't know. DeMar DeRozan, terrified. JaVale McGee, Dwight Howard, those guys are going later. And that's where we're going to put a pin in things. And tomorrow we'll pick up a Duncan Robinson on the main board. And hopefully we can start to go a little bit faster now because most of our waitlist guys have been re-slotted. Hopefully there won't be any more big news. And there's going to be a lot of guys on this board that we can just jump over, right? Like the next number of names here, Duncan Robinson and then Alec Burks, no. Draymond Green, no, not playing. Chris Dunn, out. Steven Adams, Derek Favors, there's a couple of names we'll have to do. Jeremy Lamb is in there. He's not playing. Andrew Wiggins not playing. Marcus Morris with the Clippers. That's a no. Boyan Bogdanovich is out. So we'll move pretty quick starting tomorrow. Uh, provided there isn't any giant news we need to go over again. And there might be. But for now, after finally counting them up and readjusting everything, we're at 64 names. That's it. That's it. Everything goes quicker. Some, th these drafts are really going to jump on us. Really going to jump on us. It's the big reason to get this thing all tidied up. All right. That's it. Enjoy your Tuesday, everybody. I'm Dan Bespris. This is Fantasy NBA Today, a hoopball presentation. Again, please go get something at manscaped.com with coupon code hoopball20. And we'll pick up where we left off tomorrow. So long. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.